Well, thank you very much for coming out on a beautiful day to hear the word of the Lord. And as we um, speak and share together, I just invite you to bow your heads before we begin. Father in heaven, as we open your word and as we consider the challenges that we face living in this generation, please send your spirit to speak to our hearts, to our minds, and to assure us of our value in you, is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Who can remember what they got for Christmas? It's easy for me because I get the same thing every year. I get some shortbread, some socks, a pair of t-shirt, and a Cadbury box of favourites. So I can just remember year after year after year. Anyone here get anything interesting, exciting? Who would like to get this for Christmas? Does anybody know what it is? It's a Kinnigsegg Trevita. Does anybody know why it's silver? It's made from carbon fibre and carbon fibre is usually grey-black. Does anyone know why it's silver? because every fibre of carbon is encrusted in diamond crystals. This car is worth 6.5 million Australian dollars. Anyone want one? Naught to 100 in around two and a bit seconds, top speed of 400 kilometres an hour. Useless in the flood, John. You couldn't put the fridge in it and carry it away from the rising waters. And I doubt that it's very much good for anybody who wants to make babies because it only has two seats. Just in case you accuse me of being gender biased, who would like to have this pink carat, 35 carat diamond ring on their finger? While there may be some utilitarian value to the Koenigsegg Trevita, this diamond worth around about $60 million, you would query what it's good for. I don't think it would be that nice fitting sheets on your bed with that on, would it? or trying to slide towels into your linen cupboard. Might get in the way when you're trying to squash gluten steaks. But some of you would mind if this was under your Christmas tree, would you agree? You could sell it and probably live a very nice life for many generations after it. This diamond is owned by the royal family at Qatar, and I would suspect that both the person that bought the Koenigsegg Trevita and this pink carat, 35 carat diamond would not use it every day. It would be there as a trophy to their own conspicuous consumptions. Could you agree? It would define for them that they were capable of buying and owning something that other mere mortals could only dream of. Obviously, none of us here in the church today have been affected by the ideology of consumerism. We would never think of ourselves as being contaminated by the marketing atmosphere that surrounds us. We would not subscribe to the theory that we are defined by what we buy. We would want to think that we were more noble than that. But whether we shop at an op shop or whether we order online from Gucci, all of us at one end of the spectrum are inadvertently affected by the age of consumerism. I have been guilty at some stages of looking at a Porsche Cayenne driving by me and thinking, yes, my girlfriend's Volkswagen is only a Porsche in disguise. It has the same motor and the same chassis and the same suspension and the same almost everything except the skin and the headlights. As I think about um, the age of consumerism, every time my phone rings, I feel quite chuffed that I can pull out an iPhone 7 and I feel sorry for those who are still having to make do with a Samsung, a HTC or one of the various iterations of, of phones. This computer that is on the desk in front, it has a super fast quad core i7 processor and I look at Dane over there and I'm just not sure whether he's a PC man or an Apple man, but I suspect he votes for the opposition and I feel sorry for him. Am I right or wrong? Yeah, I'm right. (laughs) When my wife makes gluten steaks, she doesn't use the Thermomix, which I would use only to wreck them, but she does bake them in an induction stove made by Fisher and Paykel. And when I watch 3ABN, I do it on a 65-inch TV and don't judge me, I bought it for under $900 at Aldi. But all of us, would you agree, are affected by living in an age where often what we own defines who we are. We have all been, to some extent, influenced by a modern consumerist trend. For thousands of years, who we are has often been defined by what I talk talk about as the three Ps. 
My identity for many, many millennia was defined by the place I was born, who my parents were, and what I did for a living. For centuries, none of those three were up for option. My birth was out of my control. The place I was born was out of my control. And to many, in many senses, what I ended up doing was also out of my control. It has only been post-industrial revolution that careers have become optional and we could actually go and train to do something other than the apprenticeship offered to us by our father or our family or our farm. Now, for probably the last two to three hundred years, people have set themselves apart by their profession. And, and some of you people with grey hair will understand the sentiment that the first question you ask someone after a general polite discussion about the weather is, what do you do? And when we got a sense of what somebody did and we knew who their father was and we knew where they were born, we could probably guesstimate almost 90% of who and what they were. Would you agree? But in an age today, the millennials, the millennial generation, as we discuss, they grow up where families are, are really sometimes very fluid and dynamic and some of them can have two or three fathers and two or three mothers before they actually make it to adulthood. Borders mean almost nothing these days. We live in a society of cyberspace and, and, and Queensland, New South Wales might have some relevance at the time of the state of origin. But really many people are living in multiple countries, in multiple spaces, with multiple languages as, as they grow up. And, and to source their identity from the family farm or, or that little village that half of the people in it are their relatives is becoming less and less important. And so the millennials are starting to define themselves not by place, parents and profession, but by their personality, by their pastimes and by their possessions. Many times you will ask someone, what do you do? And they'll say, I kite surf. We were expecting them to say, I'm an anaesthetist. But changing jobs so many times in their lifespan, what they choose to do for their, their pastimes can often be more important than their profession. Certainly their personalities and, and this penchant to be on Facebook and to be liked and to be tweeted and to create the appearance that you're having a wonderful time and an awesome experience and everybody would be interested in what you are having for breakfast. This, this drive to put yourself out there into the, into the public space is something that most of us old people have no sense or understanding and we, we can't even really comment on it without looking foolish to the generation of people who just see it as a matter, of, a matter of, of, of existence to exist in the realm of cyberspace. Our hobbies have become very much affected by the consumerist society that we live in. I was in New Zealand recently and I decided it was time to buy some hiking socks. And to my horror, I found that when I went in, you just couldn't pick a pair of socks off the rack and go and pay for them. You had these huge big posters describing in accurate detail how they were moisture resistant, moisture sucking, um, padded on the feet, insulating, all these sorts of things. And you don't buy a pair of socks anymore. You buy a sock for the left foot and a sock from the right foot. And they might be different sizes and different shapes and for different reasons. British sociologist Colin Campbell in the book Elusive Consumption defined consumerism as a social condition that occurs when consumption is especially important, if not central, to our very purpose of existence. American sociologist Robert Gunn says this ideology turns consumption from a means to an end so that acquiring goods becomes the basis of our identity and the sense of self. It is possible for us to so tie what we own to who we are and what we do that we lose the capacity to objectively see ourselves as consumers. We no longer see ourselves as consumers, we just consume because that's who we are. We no longer buy a mobile phone as a discretionary accessory. It is as necessary to us as food and water. My car, my house, my camera, my phone, they are all extensions of my personality. They say something about who I am. And so my title slide draws on this graphic that I think presents to us this interesting collision of two ideologies, an ideology that is driven by our DNA of something over which we have no say and the digital identity that we create for ourselves over which we have complete control. It is true to say for the millennials that they can be born again and again 
and again and again and again. Every three to five years, they will change the iteration of their own personalities and redefine themselves by new products, by new pastimes, by new, by new possessions. Zygmunt Berman, in his book Consuming Life, draws our attention to the dynamism of consumerism. It is an ideology that constantly holds before us the allure of reinventing ourselves. Changing identity, discarding the past and seeking new beginnings, struggling to be born again, these are promoted by that culture as duty disguised as a privilege. And in a sense, many people who have been driven by a consumerist ideology and they don't even recognise it are slaves to an ever a never-ending cycle of buy, buy, buy in order to define who you are. Borman speaks of duty disguised as privilege. We can lose our objectivity thinking that it's a privilege to upgrade, to stay fresh, when in reality we have bought into an ideology that dictates we become slaves to a relentless commitment to consume. Many in the millennial generation and those older who are mimicking them have become content with three to five year cycles for, from everything, from phones to prime ministers and even spouses. It would be simple for me to spend the rest of my time bagging consumerism and extolling the virtues of a life lived as a cultural hermit, but I don't want to do that for several reasons. If we disengage from society and pursue a monastic pathway to holiness, if we hide from the world and seek to be holy on our own and away and out of it, then we would be disobedient to Jesus who calls us to immerse ourselves in the world but not be of it. If we want to challenge and hopefully be part, part of the process of rescuing people from such a, a, um, a sinister and nasty ideology, then we, in a sense, need to understand the people that we are seeking to minister to. We want to commit ourselves to saving lost souls. We want to learn how to communicate the message of Jesus effectively. According to George Barner, who is perhaps the most prolific of all social researchers in our generation in looking at Christian churches, George Barner says that most churchgoers have not adopted a biblical worldview. They have simply added a Jesus fish on the bumper of their unregenerate consumer identities. Is that possible? Is it possible just to brand consumerism with some Jesus titles and convince ourselves that we have escaped it? I like this T-shirt that's available on an American website. I'm a Bible-believing, prayer-praying, praise-singing, faith-walking, highly-favoured, heart... Well, that is small. Heart-blessing. Who's got better eyes than me? Saved and serving, Jesus-loving Christian woman. It's almost like people in our generation want to say, I'm not just a Christian, I'm this brand of Christian. Get on the internet and you'll find there's web stores all over the internet that enable you to customise your own religious experience. You can set up your iTunes or Sonos account just to play a particular genre of Christian music. You can order a Bible cover that matches the beads that you wear around your neck and matches the bumper sticker on the back of your car. And even Bibles now are coming out, custom designed so that you can put forward the image that you would like in showing your particular brand of Christianity if you go into Kurong Bookshop, you will find that you have to wade through aisle after aisle after aisle before you get to the meat of theology. And the first seven aisles are, have, are, have got rubbers and pencils and all sorts of paraphernalia. Am I telling the truth? It's literally, a, well, I'm not going to say billion, but it's millions of dollars of industry marketing to Christians who seek to brand themselves. To live in a consumerist society or world means that we understand, who we understand ourselves to be is deeply and significantly related to what we buy or consume. What that belief does to our bloated sense of self-worth is bad enough, but far worse is what the belief that we are our own creation does to our sense of God. And so I want to ask you this morning this interesting, challenging question. Can we personalise God? Can we get a custom-made God that suits our preferences and our tastes? Can we toss him aside when 
the particular brand of God we got be, becomes unfavorable and we want to pursue a new iteration that is in keeping with the trend? Do we pastor shop, church shop, and remain loyal only as we get that what our consumer mentality is desiring? Do we get bored with the particular way that something happens so that we seek for something new all the time? How do we as Christians catch the attention of people in our community who know where we are but don't seem to want to come and fellowship with us? As a church, do we need to be constantly rebranding? Do we need to be innovative? Do we need to be on the cutting market? Oh, sorry, on the cutting edge. Do we need to target market a niche? Or do we aim to be appealing to the masses? Do we measure our success by our market share? And might we listen more attentively to Madison Avenue than the still small voice? Our greatest danger in responding to a consumerist culture is that we simply do nothing and refuse to engage a consumerist culture. We cloister ourselves away in the safety of our own spiritual fortress, erected and sustained by those who want to avoid the outside contamination of the world until Jesus comes. Jesus himself addressed consumerism when he said to those listening to him, Beware and be on your guard against every form of greed, for not even when one has an abundance is his life defined by his possessions. Do you think with the recent floods that there will be some people who suddenly recognise that things that they have placed an inestimable value upon are perhaps not as important as they thought it to be? There will be others who will be mourning that that which they have invested so much of their time and labour and hard-earned money has come to a swift end. Jesus goes on when, after he had said this to his disciples to tell the story of a man who had plenty and his fields were blessed and he had an abundance of grain. And rather, seeing, rather than seeing he was in a position where he could distribute his advantage to those who were disadvantaged, he instead said, no, I want bigger barns. I want more capacity. I want to reach a position in my life where I can actually say, you have done so well that you are secure and you can now enjoy life without any further problem. And Jesus called this man a fool and pointed out that all the wealth in the world made no difference to the time of his death and did not provide him security in the afterlife. Jesus urges us to be different. Instead of working under duress to reach a point where we don't need to trust, God instead invites his followers to trust so they don't need to work under duress. That has been so precious to me over the last six months. Rather than struggling and working and sweating to reach a point where I say, God, I don't need you. God says, you need me and you don't need to worry about working under duress. It's a very attractive ideology. Those immersed in consumerism, if they could understand the joy of a Christian who is fully convinced that what God has promised he will do, it brings such relief and such comfort and enables us to live lives of purpose. And I know as I'm looking out there, I'm preaching to the choir. This is not something that we need to see as new light. It is the experience we live. We have chosen as Christians to give away 10% of our income, to make the statement boldly before God and the universe that as we return his tithe, that we trust him to care for us and that 90% with him is worth so much more than 100% without him. In Jesus' teaching, there is no endorsement for us to build our own brand, but there is an invitation to be relentless and intentional in being consumed in building his brand. Do you think that John the Baptist ran an effective marketing campaign? The crowds poured out into the desert to participate in his revolution. Jesus was endorsed 
with perhaps the greatest of all marketing ploys of all time, an audible and a visual spectacular occurred when he was baptised. A voice from heaven and the form of the Holy Spirit in a dove. In his teaching, Jesus reclaimed truth from tradition. He rescued it and repackaged it to attract a new clientele. Jesus speaks the language of being born again, of being refreshed, of being renewed. Jesus was creative. He thought outside the box. He forged into new markets. Saints, the devil has no useful new ideas. He only borrows that which works for the kingdom and adulterates it for his own purpose. If we want to be effective in this modern day, we cannot take for granted that our presence is enough. We need to work hard to market the gospel of Christ in a way that is authentic but attractive, that is stimulating but still real. I know that this little church is actively involved in connecting with our community. Richard and Ros and a few others have just left because they're going down to Ballina to participate in housing people who are under the evacuation order. There are many people here who are involved with the op shop, the women's refuge. There are teachers here who give their lives in sacrificial service in our school system. We've got a retirement village that some of our, our church members are involved in. And those of us who are not officially or denominationally employed, we live our lives in such a way that we want to make it known that Christ has touched our lives and has helped us overcome this, cons um, this consumption with ourselves, this, this addiction to ourselves and to actually be engaged in the community around us. But if we were able to give every person in Alstonville the best education, if we were able to clothe them with some budget-priced clo clothes, if we could provide a haven of safety and give them a, a happy retirement, they will still at the end of the day have much more to learn. Their clothes will still wear out. And as far as I'm aware, no one in our retirement village has lived past the age of 110. But in Jesus, they will find a wellspring of enthusiasm and of energy and of an abundant life that will go on forever and forever and forever. We believe with every person infected with the consumerist ideology that we need to be a born again. We need to be more than we are. We need to be something greater than the identity that comes from parents, place and profession. But we also need to be something greater than our personality, our pastime, and our possessions. Jesus offers up for the, op for the opportunity for all of us to retire from our efforts to build our own brand, to forge our own identity. We can reject the need to be liked, to be retweeted, to have enough views and to be significant in our own right. We can be delivered of the pressing urgency to be noticed and to be significant. And instead we can immerse ourselves in the magnificence and significance and the resources of the God of the universe. Paul, the apostle, experienced this new identity. Listen to his story as he paraphrases it in the message. You know my pedigree, a legitimate birth, circumcised on the eighth day, an Israelite from the elite tribe of Benjamin, a strict and devout adherent to God's law, a fiery defender of the purity of my religion, even to the point of persecuting the church, a meticulous observer of everything set down in God's law book. The very credentials these people are waving around as something special, I'm tearing up and throwing out with the trash, along with everything else I used to take credit for. And why? Because of Christ. Yes, all things I once thought were so important are gone from my life compared to the high privilege of knowing Jesus Christ as my master firsthand. Everything I once thought I had going for me is insignificant. I've dumped it all in the trash so that I could embrace Christ and be embraced by him. I didn't want some petty inferior brand of righteousness that comes from keeping a list of rules when I could get the robust kind that comes from trusting God's righteousness. I gave up all that inferior stuff so that I could know Christ personally, experience his resurrection power, be a partner in his suffering 
and go all the way with him to death itself. If there was any way to get on in the resurrection from the dead, I wanted to do it. There is nothing wrong with paint. There is nothing wrong with fresh menus, new logos, the latest projectors and televisions, updated sound systems, new music, new songs, new ways of doing old things. But nothing new or innovative or special or niched can substitute our need to know Jesus and to be known by him. It is inevitable in our day and age that we will have cars and houses and phones and computers and food and clothes, but let us never allow these to define us or make us feel better or make us feel less. We are invited to recognise the privilege we have of being the children of God, of having God as our Father, heaven as our home, and building his kingdom as our profession. We need to be about his business. If we take seriously Jesus' invitation to live in him, we will find the paradox of the gospel a reality in our own life. Those constantly searching to fulfil their dreams, to buy more, to get more, to be more, can reach the pinnacle of their own hopes and fantasies and they will find to their horror that it is not enough. The paradox of the gospel is that giving up on my significance and immersing myself in his significance, giving up in my dreams and instead seeking to fulfil his dreams, giving up on my kingdom and instead building his kingdom, giving up on likes for me and instead working for likes for him. It is in being prepared to lose my brand and to build his brand that we will find ultimate meaning, real purpose and true happiness. Jesus invites us into the experience of a life abundant and a life that is driven by experiencing the fullness of joy. And so my challenge to you is the same as it is my challenge to myself. We may not be aware of the society we live in because we're too close, we're too proximate, we're too immersed in it. But as far as cultural analysis and sociological observation is, we are the society that has an absolute abundance of wealth and yet so many of us feel so poor because we do not measure up to the expectations of the flashing lights and the television advertisement and the sidebar ads which are constantly bombarding us with the idea that until we have this product or, 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 or this experience, we are not really living. Will we become incapacitated and unable to participate in God's kingdom because of our slavery and our addiction to that consumerism? God forbid. Let us be among those who are truly willing to die in order that we may live. As we sing our last hymn, Rock of Ages, Cleft for Me, my challenge to you is to focus on the words of this hymn. Try and get a sense of what the guy who wrote it really wants us to understand. Know what it means for you to surrender your own desire to be significant and instead to be immersed and connected to and taken over by him. Lord, you did not ask any of us to surrender our own individuality and our identity. Lord, you loved us enough that you would have come and died for each and every person in this room. You care for us. You value us. You want us to live our life to the full. But I pray that we would understand the true nature of biblical humility It is not in making ourselves small and insignificant as much as it is becoming fully aware of how great you are and of your magnificence. Help us to recognise that we can never be more significant than at your feet. We can never be as valuable as when we are lost in you. Give us the confidence to walk a counter-narrative to the story of this world that we will not be defined 
and that we will not define others by what they have or do or wear or buy, but that we will be defined in that we are your children and we will define others as those for whom you died, is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.